First of all, I want to thank everyone so much for coming. I want to thank Cheryl for inviting me and Carrie for inviting me for this unique opportunity. Just want to give you guys a little bit of a background for me as well too. Ooh, sorry about that. Move on to the next one. So before I even give you guys a little introduction about myself, I'm going to be talking about what the Man Train Guide is. What does a typical day look like? And also the research behind the Man Train Diet with bariatric patients as well and how you can incorporate the man trained diet with your current lifestyle as well too. It's a new thing. I know that this is a, a brand new thing for a lot of people. So just seeing if I can give you guys some tips to help you with incorporating it as well. So just a little background about me. I graduated from Fresno State with a degree in nutrition, food and nutritional science with a background in dietetics and food administration back in 2016. I'm 100% Portuguese, I even have I always carry this flag all the time with me all the time just because of how much passion I am. And you'll see why I put that on there as well with the man trained diet. The next thing is that I'm a grad student and a dietetic intern for the Auburn University for the master's program, dietetic internship program. And I'm currently doing my thesis research project on the man trained diet. And you'll see here why it's highlighted, it's lifestyle. It's not per se a diet. The biggest thing is that people think about as this is a one way, a short term thing to do. No, it's actually a lifestyle that we do research on. And I'm doing it with the Portuguese older adult population in Trelaw. And I'm also going to Italy in June to do, do a little bit more research on this topic as well too. So what is the man trained diet? What did you guys, what do you hear about the man trained diet before I even go on? What's the one thing you guys hear from it? Have you guys Fresh. heard about it before? Fresh. Fresh food, okay. Fish, perfect. What else on the side here? Whole foods. Whole foods, perfect. I, you guys have a really good idea of what exactly what it Grains. is. Grains as well too, perfect. But before I move on, I'd like to add a comic here. If you guys can read it, it's, you know, I try to make it funny, lifeful as well too. I'm a very comedic person. And the man training diet is supposed to be a very healthy diet. Can you write me a prescription for a vacation in Greece? So I like to try and make it uplifting and really, uh, a community thing that I always put into my presentations as well too. So Dr. Azel Keys, he is an American physiologist who studied the influences on diet with these types of populations. And he also was very famous for the Minnesota starvation diet back in the 40, uh, 1944 and 1945, seeing how the starvation mode was affecting uh, prisoner of wars back in World War II. So he's very famous uh, in the research field so he wanted to study the effects of our diet in America with cardiovascular disease. He did the seven country uh, study, and it's mostly a 25 year study that they study the risk and the uh, rates of heart attacks and stroke uh, correlated to the cholesterol rate in America. But, you know, who's the population? It's, there's a lot of people, about 12,000 males from 40 to 15 years of age, and they came from all over the world, <coughs> from the United States, Northern Europe, like France and Spain, uh, Southern Europe as well as uh, Portugal as well, and also Japan. So you'll see in this, uh, this graph right here, the sh you'll see here that the Jap Japanese and the Mantrain region had less deaths, but they also had less saturated fat consumption. You'll notice that you'll see a trend, this, this white trend here, seeing the more uh, cholesterol, or the more saturated fats percentage, the more likely of deaths from uh, cardiovascular disease. So he wanted to study that uh, in back in the 1960s. <clears throat> and so you'll see here the mandatory diet developed from just the research from the what he found. So this is not a, a diet that was established from here, it's actually from the research that they provided. You notice that a lot of the main train regions were drinking a, a lot of water. They were, you know, not a lot of sodas, mostly on the olive oil. So he noticed that and he developed this type of diet. He made this famous in this region. The, the death from heart attacks and from the Northern Europeans greatly exceeded the areas in the Southern European countries when they controlled the age, cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, and other factors as well too. So you'll see here that when they put those aligned together, 
they noticed that the biggest difference that they saw was the <coughs> consumption of how much saturated fats they were consuming along with cholesterol as well. So when they controlled that, they were able to see that there was a big difference in that as well too. So you'll see here the man trained legion right here. Uh, they noticed that there's a large, uh, lower prevalence of these diseases here. And it's so amazing that they studied Spain and Portugal. They studied Italy and Sicily, and they also studied Greece as well too. So the reason why I put Portuguese is because my parents, my grandparents were involved in this research study as well too, because they saw that they did a lot of fish, a lot of eggs, milk, there's no a lot of red meats back then, back in the 40s and 30s. They all grew up with this type of lifestyle back then. So just wanted to give you guys the key components of the man trained diet. The man trained diet is not a typical diet, and I want to emphasize that clearly. It's not a typical diet. And most nutrition and medical professionals consider this a lifestyle modification, complete change. So the way they view the food, how much they're eating, who is around them. This is more complex as you do than just saying, I'm not gonna eat carbs. I don't wanna eat certain foods because they are being fat. So it's a big modification as well. It's mostly plant-based. So you'll see mostly on the plate, it's mostly fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and nuts. With just these, you can get a whole good source of your vitamins and minerals, your protein, Legumes have the protein, the nuts have the protein as well too. Next, it's replacing butter. Replacing uh, butter with healthier fats such as olive oil and other oils that I'll, uh, that I'll demonstrate later on in this presentation. And also using herbs and spices rather than sodium to flavor foods. And the biggest key is that you wanna limit the amount of red meats to no more than a few times a month. It's a very hard thing to do in this age right now because it's heavenly in our face. I understand this might be a big change, but this is definitely something that's a big key a component of the Mediterranean diet. So just moving on to more of it, eating fish and poultry at least twice a week, sharing meals and enjoying meals with your family and friends. The purpose of food is not to be eating alone, it's to share among your friends, your families. That's the biggest thing about the Mediterranean diet is that hey, I have some extra food, come over to my house, enjoy this meal with me. You also lower the amount of how much you're over consuming in that meal. There's a lot of research behind how social aspects of eating can help you with eating less as well. So there's no eating or snacking in front of the TV. That's a big thing that they have uh, in a lot of different definitions of a mentoring diet. The main meal is in the day with a nap after. So that's one of the components, but it's, it's actually unique because in Europe they have siesta. So a siesta is when you're uh, like with, within two to four o'clock, they take a nap. <coughs> and that's how they recharge the whole day and trying to finish up the whole night as well too. And to get plenty of rest and getting a lot of exercise as well too. So getting a good amount of walking with your family, getting a good amount of, of stretching, of breathing, these are the key components of the Mediterranean diet. And you'll see later on that there's a pyramid that we have for the Mediterranean diet. So what does a typical eating pattern look like in the Mediterranean lifestyle? So just want to give you guys a look at uh, a common food practice that we see in Italy. And I will later see this in May and June as well too. A lot of it is farm to table foods. So when you see plants here and they're growing certain uh, vegetables and fruits, grabbing that and they'd be able to be eating that from straight to the source or straight to your table. That's the method of the farm to table uh, method for a lot of uh, organizations that we try to do. If you do the farm markets, you get it from the farm market and you put it to your table. There's no in between, there's no middleman person. And there's no snack foods. So the big thing about snacks is that having a fruit, having a vegetable, that is your snack and your dessert. So there's no processed food, there's no chips. There's nothing in particular that they make, they grab, and they process it through a factory. The main food, the main meal is eaten throughout the day, through, during the day at two o'clock. So I'm not asking you to eat at two o'clock, but this is a common food pattern that we see in Italy because of how the culture is working around how much we eat. So at two o'clock they eat, and then they have a siesta. 
instead of having that 5.30 to 6 o'clock. So we have that common practice of eating so much food at 6 o'clock that we end up our night with feeling lethargic, feeling tired, and usually you're supposed to finish strong throughout the day like that. And you'll see there's a lot of vegetables, dishes, and olive oil as a main entree. So I'll show you guys a little bit more about that later in this presentation. And the fruits on your plates is your dessert. So that's the key component that there is no desserts after dinner or lunch. It is your fruit on your plate. That is your dessert for that. And at least one meal shared with your friends and family. That is the number one thing that we do, especially in many European cultures, they, they share a meal with their families. A lot of us are conditioned to work, make more money, not sharing the, the special times we have with our families, which is a very important, important component of the Mediterranean diet. So I was just stating about earlier about the man training lifestyle pyramid. This is the foundation of it. You'll see here that there's the social aspects, dancing, eating with your families, walking, playing uh, physical act, uh, active, as well as the foods. And you'll see that I'll go over these each individually uh, very quickly for, for, for each of you guys, okay? The most important thing is that you're getting a good source of this in your in your everyday meals, okay? So the vegetables. So we want to try to aim for about four or more servings per day. The serving size of vegetables, depending on if you cook it or if you eat it raw, the raw version is that you have it at a cup. When you cook it, about half a cup. So this is the serving size that we see about four or more of these every day. You want to try and aim for every single meal with this, with this uh, serving uh, serving size. I want to milk on my, my water. So the next thing is to be very creative. Make your plate very colorful. The key thing about vegetables is that it can, they can be colorful. You can have a lot of spinach. You can have green and gre green bell peppers, carrots, and you're just going to go over these uh, these specific ones you'll see in Italy. Uh, and Sicily, Portugal, Spain, and the Greece areas, that they uh, share these common uh, food cuisines as well. You'll see eggplants, tomatoes, these are good sources of fiber, vitamin C, vitamin E, A. So the big emphasis is that trying to make your foods more colorful as well too, okay? So the next thing is the fruits. The key component of the fruit is to make sure it's also colorful fresh. You know, there's no discrimination about frozen or canned. Being smart about when you have canned fruits, if you're worried about the sodium, wash it off. Put it through a strainer. Be able to wash it off the excess of sodium that they may carry throughout the canning process. And also, choose whole fruits instead of fruit juices. There's not a lot of research behind people drinking juice as a fruit uh, group in Italy. They do mostly their whole foods like that. Like exactly what you were saying from the beginning, whole foods, whole foods as well. So you just wanna make sure that there, there's just a few examples as well too here. The apples, the oranges, the bananas. These are key components as well too for the Mediterranean diet and you wanna aim for at least a cup of, of uh, fruits every day, okay? And you'll see here the avocados are actually shared. They're a fruit and consider a fruit and for a healthy fat as well too. So there's mangoes and peaches as well. Those are all things we have available to us here, right? Yeah. So it's not nearly impossible to get it from your local stores as well. So the next thing is that grains. So you wanna try in the main train recommendation to around four or more servings of grains. And we're not talking about uh, cereals, they're talking about more on uh, pita breads, raw oats. I understand that many of you are at, not at that point where you can consume the grains right now, but this is an important thing that they have in the Mediterranean diet, so at least get around two or three or four when you're ready, when your uh, bowel movements or your gut health is ready for uh, grains as well too, okay? So you'll have couscous, you'll have pasta of any shape or size, 
There's no discrimination about that. And also to have a brown rice or black red rice. You'll see most, mostly in the Italy uh, area that they have these brown red rice that they can get from the fields. And white rice is not a big thing in Italy because we don't process, there's no processing in the Mediterranean region as well. So next, the fats. This is the, the fatty uh, part of the, the Mediterranean lifestyle pyramid. And it's mostly on just trying to get four servings of, not of a half a cup or a whole cup, but to get a tablespoon of your servings as well too. So you'll see mostly that olive oil is the principal fat of the Mediterranean lifestyle. It's because what they do is they do a lot of research behind how it may help you with your heart health and your brain health as well. So that's the main component of that as well too. So you'll see here I added some of the healthy fats that, are subs that can be substitutes for extra virgin olive oil. So you, all these are very important for you to add into your everyday lifestyle when consuming a Mediterranean diet. And you'll see here that the avocado oil, yes, it is pretty expensive per liter, but you can always get the olive oil that can be a good alternative for that. There's nothing really uh, organic. There's just extra virgin olive oil. That's the main thing we try aiming for is that if you have that, it doesn't have to be uh, different different marketing names. Is it canola processed oil? Yes, it can be. But it does big, there is a big uh, research behind how it may help you. In excess of yes, mm -hmm. if you're having around a whole layer of, of oil in your pot and you're frying that with like chicken or bread and chicken, yeah. Yeah, that could be very, it just depends on how you utilize it as well okay. too. Olive oil is the same way. Any type of fat that you use can be, can be, can be harmful for you. In excessive amounts as well but to go back to you <coughs> any oil that you see is processed as well they have to get it from the natural state yeah. into an oil like that but there's yeah, not a seed. plant that's a canola correct you see a lot of different uh, oils and vegetable oils yeah. like that exactly other fats as well as the avocados and, and olives as well too and the nuts and fish you'll see a lot of good source of mono and polyunsaturated fats in these types of food products as well too. So the beans and seeds and nuts. So you wanna try to get a good variety. This is where your, your protein source is gonna be in the main train of lifestyle. You'll see mostly on trying to get around one to two servings uh, per day. And that's around half a cup. If you wanna be very particular, the almonds that I have here, you want to try to get it to a half a cup. So this is a serving of nuts. It's about 24 almonds. It's about 14 walnut halves. Uh, the peanuts are about 28 of them in a serving. And I think, and I want to believe, and I wrote this down, there's 40 uh, pistachios in one serving. So you'll see when they're uh, shelled and they're put into the half a cup, that's around that area as well too. And so the beans as well too. So instead of using um, using a uh, type of meat, you can always put hummus. And this hummus is a good source of protein as well for many individuals who are trying to be a vegetarian. Yes, go ahead. I read once though that um, nut and bean protein is not a complete protein unless you add a starch with that. So it's not well, depending on it, like for beans and rice, those are the ones that complement each other because Rice is missing an amino acid, right. and beans are missing an amino acid. And you're, I believe you're correct, you're very, very correct. But yeah. pairing these together is what's gonna be a key component for as well, too. They actually, because it doesn't have to be a, the same meal. I mean, if no. you get starch and apple meal and beans at another, it's good. Right. Beef, it's still good. Right. right, so they're looking more at variety now. So, they, because it's like you guys both were saying, right? They complement each other, but they don't have to be at the same meal um, anymore. So that's kind of a old old school from my era. Um, but yeah, so they're not saying that you have to have them together anymore. Yeah. So, <coughs> so this is the uh, special area as well too, because a lot of people are thinking that it's gonna be mostly just milk. 
and in the dairy and in this area, it's mostly yogurt, hard cheeses, things that are not going to be too harmful for you. So for example, a cup of milk can have a lot of lactose compared to maybe a cube of cheese the size of your thumb. It's pretty low amount of lactose, which may not be harmful for you, especially in the position of where you're at in your surgery as well. So the big component about yogurt is that you want to try to get Greek or plain, something that, that's not added. No added sugar, no added uh, additives as well to give you more flavor. Greek is mostly trying to get a good amount of protein. So a good one would be the triple zero. The, I believe it's the Oko's triple zero. They do the good amount of source of protein, the zero fat, zero added sugars, and they also, if you can correct me on this, the other zero might be on the fat, sugar, and any added sh additives, I think. It might be around that area. No, right, because they use yeah. stevia, yes. so they don't use sugar substitutes. Exactly, so it's a good, it's a good uh, choice to use for yogurts as well. And so going to low-fat milk, they do drink uh, milk, but not in an excessive amount as well. And choosing any types of cheese. This is the, these are some Italian and uh, French cheeses I have listed here, like feta, mozzarella, ricetta. You were saying, go ahead. Um, I just wondered, um, wouldn't you, the low fat milk, instead of it being low fat milk, uh, be more like goat milk? Yeah, it could be exactly like that. But then you try to aim for the, uh, the recommendations in the United States as well too, because we try to make a big push about calories, how much calories there is as well. But goat milk is, is found in Italy and France as well. And you, there is a good source of, of that. But depending on what you, what else you drink or what else you eat, it also plays a big part in your cuisine as well. But yeah, you can definitely go for the goat milk. I remember my parents, they have a goat milk plant right by their, their locker. And a lot of people ask about the same questions about the milk and goats. Is there a big benefit to it? There is, and there is a big benefit to uh, different types of milk depending on what you do. Like for example, almond milk may not have protein, but it's a good amount of low, uh, lowered calories. So there's benefits to a lot of different milks that we have available for us as well. Some people that are lactose intolerant, that's a good source as well. So these are different types of cheeses that you'll see that you can get from your uh, local farm market, and they can always be a good source of dairy for you as well. What is a serving? Serving cheese. So cheese would be at one ounce for the size of your thumb. The milk is around half a cup. So you want to try to get to, to this right here. Half a cup right here. So yeah, you can use your thumb. That's a good uh, a good thing to use for your serving size. But you know, if you want to get the block, you want to make sure that you get a, a good size when you cut your cheese. You want to make sure it's around the size of your thumb. Like that. Okay? Go ahead. Most of those are white cheese. Is there a difference between white and yellow cheese? Well, yellow cheese, and I can speak for the American version of yellow. There's a lot of different American cheeses that are heavily processed. So a lot of the cheeses that the, you see here are mostly the goat cheese, mostly the cow milk cheese. So every single uh, animal produces a good <coughs> variety of fat content, of sweetness, so depending on how you uh, finish or how you feed your animal in Italy provides how much good your cheese will be later on. So if you're a big, big fan of cheese, you want to go for a more fattier taste, the goat cheese would be a good source of that good taste compared to milk, uh, cow milk as well. So, so like you're saying like cheddar has more processed. It could be more processed like that as well. So. Just depending on what they do, how they uh, how they process that cheese. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with consuming that type of cheese, but making sure that you're getting a good amount of calcium, and making sure you lower the amount of calories you're consuming. That's the key thing as well too. So the fish and seafood. You'll see here that it's in this area now. So now we're going up a little bit more, and you see that they want to try to get to around two to three servings per week. So not just per day, per week. So it's not, and in this cuisine, it may be very easy because a lot of people are fishermen. My parents, uh, my, my uh, grandparents were fishermen. They were able to provide and be able to, uh, to save these animals through salting 
and whenever they're ready to consume them, they wash it off yeah. and they would make it into, I know it's a little bit, it's a little rough to imagine, <laughs> but back then in the 50s and 60s, they, that's how they provided a, preser a preservation. Yeah, the... So it's, I know it's a little bit rough to get that salt in the face. So it's a good source of omega-3s. This is the type of fat that you'll see that are very healthy for our hearts and for our brains as well too. You'll see that in salmon, tuna, sardines, artichokes, clams, oysters, mussels. These are uh, these shellfish right here as well too. Uh, and you know, this is a big cuisine as well in, in this area as well. But I wanted to be very careful about when I add shark, oh, sorry, not shark, sorry, swordfish, because it is a secondary uh, secondary predator. It means it feeds off of other fish. You'll see mostly more mercury in this uh, fish product here. So if you choose the other ones, you will get on the bottom of the, the totem pole, where you'll see less amount of mercury if you're worried about that particular uh, particular mineral in your in your system. Yes, go ahead. I know fresh is best, but is like ham tuna still a good option? Like if you're worried about a drench in oil, you can definitely wash it off and try to see if you want to lower the amount of calories. That's my suggestion. I wouldn't say it's necessarily bad. But they have tuna in water, so it's fine. That's completely fine. Yeah. That's my personal belief. It's completely fine. Okay. If it's uh, if it's like added with like sodium or different types of, of yeah. additives. Yeah. Then you want to wash it off and try to put it through a strainer to help you out. Go ahead. Do you get more of a benefit of fresh seafood than canned? Because well, on the aisles, there's a lot of canned yeah. tuna, sardines, shrimp. Yeah. You know. So it, it just depends on on you. If you want to, if you have something planned and you have fresh fish that you can prepare on a grill, and it works perfectly with what you have. Like for example, if I would want. Like for my cuisine, uh, there's a lot of sardines. We get them fresh from the fish market and we add a lot of soup, potatoes, green beans, other vegetables that we can be able to provide that taste. If you are someone who's just want to snack on some fish, canned fish, and you want to put it in, like in, a, in a salad, it just depends on what you want to do. What, whatever's more convenient for you, whatever's easier for you at that time, okay? Like we were saying earlier too, right? A lot of times when things are canned or processed, you've got to watch the added fats, the oils, the salt, that type of thing. So that would be the other difference. But you know, otherwise, if you're getting it like packed in water and it's not full of salt, then sure, that would be still a good alternative. So would calorie count change with canned stuff compared to fresh? No, only if you're adding oil to it. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's just the processing of it. It's not necessarily like I said, unless you're adding oil. So now we're going to the eggs and the poultry. Eggs are deemed the, the golden standard, the ideal protein for this, this cuisine. It does provide a good amount of, of minerals, <coughs> vitamins for the particular person, and also can give you, it's, there has a long history with it as well too. Back then in, in my family's culture, they do a lot of eggs and milk, and they make a lot of breads. That's a good source of protein as well too, but it depends on how you know, there's a lot of starvation in, in the Azores Islands. So they do, they try to make things that are more prevalent, try to make it more uh, long lasting as well. And eggs provide a good, good amount of protein, like I said, vitamin A, D, E. There's a lot of uh, cholesterol, which is a good source of, of cholesterol. But again, this is the, there is no, I wanna make, I wanna straighten this out, that cholesterol in eggs are not to be worried compared to over consuming how much you're eating. So if you're eating too much and your cholesterol is high and you're eating a lot of fatty foods, there's a bigger difference with that compared to just eating one egg, okay? So poultry is a, another additional source that you can provide for your protein as well. You wanna to try to get at least two to three servings per week. So a serving would be around three to four ounces of your palm, your ideal size for uh, a serving size is your, is your palm. So if you have a small palm, yeah, you might have to put it out together, but a palm for like for me, that's like a pretty good source of like three to four ounces 
of protein right there, okay? So the spices, this is the, the big emphasis that we want to try to lower the amount of sodium in your everyday life. And that how they do that is that they add spices rather than sodium. So Mrs. Dash is a big thing that we try to incorporate into other people's lifestyles because it provides spices and not just, not, not so, no sodium as well. So basil, bay leaves, you have puri puri, puri, puri. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, puri puri, pepper, the garlic, lavender, nutmeg, oregano, paprika, paprika, and rosemary. These are things that they would add onto the dish along with their salads, their soups, just to make it tasty and along with lowering the amount of sodium. So if you're someone who's worried about the <coughs> high, uh, high blood pressure, this is a, a big component as well too for that as well. And sage and saffron. These are a little bit more of a, saffron's a little bit more expensive, but going with the garlic or the nutmeg, the oregano, these are good, still good uh, sources of spices as well for, for you guys. And this is the, the top of the list, the meats and the sweets. These are once in a great wild foods. And I wanted to emphasize this to you, to everyone, that sweets are just strongly discouraged in this type of lifestyle because we don't. There's not a lot of processing. There's not a lot of sitting down. Again, in America, you know, you can definitely have your uh, your sweets, but you have it in fruit form. So save uh, your sweets that you have just for a little bit and providing and substituting with with fruits for desserts. It's a big thing. If you get a lot of the fruit toast, which is really sweet, you get that from the fruits, okay? And the red meats, this is a big change for, uh, for many cultures in this area because when they come to America, they see a lot of red meat consumption as well too because it's very prevalent. They have a strong business as well in this area where a lot of red meat, for, uh, it's easy to get. And you wanna eat this in small amounts. So again, having once in a great while, so maybe two or three times per month for this. And that's about three to four ounces, okay? But you wanna substitute that for a better lean source, which is beans, uh, eggs, uh, seafood, and poultry as well too, okay? Just to lower the amount of cal calories. So you'll see here, I provided a recipe for <coughs> everyone here. This is a very basic one. I didn't wanna to go too extravagant because if I go too extravagant, might feel like, wow, it's a lot of ingredients. And I don't want you guys to feel kind of discouraged about this. This is actually a recipe that I made with my parents. It's very simple. You're just adding a lot of good sources of vegetables. You have um, the carrots and your protein sources, the, the beans, the lentils, and you want to add some avocado and that can be a good source of, uh, of all, 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 all around meal in the Mediterranean diet as well. Okay? And so you want to get the recipe here. That's where it shows the damage, uh, all the ingredients as well too here, okay? So just to go through this very quickly, I'll go through one of them with you. And the most important one is that I want to talk about the, the top concerns with uh, bariatric patients. The research behind the mandatory diet with, with the bariatric population is very weak. There still needs to be more research behind how it affects the areas I have not highlighted. So there's not a lot of strong research behind if it can help with deficiencies or gallstones, but it can help you. There is research behind preoperative weight loss and weight gain after bariatric surgery. If you adapt this and be good adherence to it, you can show that there's strong evidence of keeping the weight off longer than someone who doesn't. So just want to go over this with you. This um, this is the one that I was telling you just a little brief thing about how it may be weak in the United States and they're still developing. In Italy and Spain is where the, the mother load of research articles are coming from in the hospitals. But they do provide a good uh, amount of research behind these uh, types of, of areas with just regular uh, human population or just with uh, older adults or the younger adult population. So just wanna go over this with you again. This is just a very quick one. They want to do on the adherence for pre and post operative surgery with the main trained diet and how it affects on the weight loss and cardiovascular disease or risk after laparoscopic sleeve 
gastronomy, I think that's why I said, I'm sorry about that, just a sleeve procedure as well. So you'll see here that they have 50 participants. So it's not very big. That's why it's very important to get research articles that provide good amount of source, but this is a very, uh, this is one of the ones they have in the United States as well too, okay? So they, I, they test the adherence. So the adherence meaning that I have a little thing that I do from a research article, and they ask you questions on, do you use olive oil as your main fat? Do you, how many servings of red meat do you consume every day? So seeing where you're at and me testing you and point wise shows me how much adherence you have for this diet. So for these particular people before their surgery, they tested very poor in their adherence and 6% of them have a good adherence to it, meaning that they are adapting what we discussed earlier today. But after we did the one year, the one year post uh, review, actually completely reversed. 2% showed poor adherence. So whenever I show you this and we administrate uh, classes, to teach you on your adherence and try to adapt certain areas. They show you better adherence compared to other people that did not before the surgery. And with that, they'll see a bigger influence on their scores with weight loss, their total cholesterol levels, and LDL cholesterol. So it's very important. These, these, these two ones right here play a big part in our, your heart health. So how much of you know, your risk of heart attacks or strokes. These are big things. So inverse means that the bigger, your better your scores are, the lower your risk for these diseases or for this area. And so the other one is the direct correlation between the scores that you have on these tests and your HDL, which is considered your good cholesterol in your blood, which means that you have good carriers of cholesterol throughout your system carry into where it needs to go to the feces and excrete it out. So that's what the HDL does for you, to help you with getting rid of the cholesterol. So I was gonna go over this with you guys. Just wanted to be, let you guys see the, the, uh, the study here just really quick. And I was gonna discuss this with you, but I have a little bit of time. I just wanted to make sure I get over with the tips for you. I think it's really important. If you guys wanna discuss this with me, you can definitely discuss it. Uh, after the presentation as well too. I definitely would love to talk to you guys about this as well, okay? So again, this needs to be stronger. There's a lot of uh, areas that we love to research a little bit more and that's my job when I become a registered dietitian and hopefully a researcher for a study <laughs> to be able to study this and provide good research for this population as well too. So you'll see here that the Mediterranean diet provides a good uh, a good in uh, intervention for people that are trying to lose weight before they get to in the surgery. So you'll see here that they try to, they significantly decrease the following areas. So they decrease their weight, their liver size, the visceral fat, the fat mass. But the big thing is that they do not want to have reduction in fat free mass, which is your muscles. So when you have someone that goes through this type of diet, and it's heavily focused on the protein, they actually preserve the muscle mass before the surgery. And that's a big thing that we, that we, hit, we see in this, in this uh, study here. So just to give you an overall picture of this, the key thing is to have balance. The balance of making sure of focusing on what you can do and what's suggested to you. I just add this just for comedy purposes, and I thought it was really funny to add that. But just the main focus that I wanna to try to say, speak to you guys that it's very limited. There's a limited amount of research that we have with bariatric patients in the diet in the United States as well. But there is a significant reduction in visceral fats, fat mass, uh, the weight without muscle loss in this population. So again, 30 participants that are males. So do you need a little bit more research behind it, but it does provide a good of, of leeway for someone who wants to perfect that study as well. So a better adherence to the mentoring diet provides good reduction in the fat-related lipid panels in this area, and also provides improvement in the HDL, okay? 
So the last one is the adherence to the diet is actually better, demonstrates better compared to, uh, compared to physical activity when, when in regards to quality of life and the magnitude of the weight loss and the uh, tolerance to the diet. So how hard is the diet to incorporate into your lifestyle? That's what they uh, did a study on, okay? So how can I incorporate the Mediterranean diet into my lifestyle? Mm -hmm. So I just want to give you guys some honest tips. I provide some tips of, of my, from a booklet that I got from the Mediterranean diet from my, uh, from my research uh, advisor. And you want to involve other people. You're not doing this alone. The, the key thing is that if you want to incorporate this, invite other people. Try to experiment a little bit more and examine your schedule. See where your availability is at. For a lot of people, it's the weekend. So trying to plan your meals out in the weekend and cooking on the next day provides a good foundation for you to when you're cooking as well. So anticipate the obstacles you'll see, especially in, um, in, in this population. You know, as you've seen how you tolerate the foods, seeing how well things go down, being safe about it. So anticipate the obstacles you'll see here. And also seeing the foods that you can appreciate in your lifestyle. So I'm not asking you to eat a fish, fish eyes because that's not, that's unrealistic. To see like where you're at with your lifestyle, you can always get the fruits and vegetables that you see in the farm markets or the local uh, stores. So there's nothing too dramatic as well too. And getting familiar with the ingredients and styles of cooking that you have right now. So seeing how much oil you put in your pan, see how much salt you put in your cooking, try to get familiar with what you can improve as well too and prioritize your goals, seeing what's more important. Is it the, is it the uh, cooking new meals? Is it trying to make new recipes? So just prioritizing what, what you can do with your lifestyle as well too. So just going over a little bit more about this, I think it's really important that you follow your MD recommendations and your RD recommendations. So if you're willing to try something, try to see if it can work with an RD or with your MD. Don't try to go overboard and trying to put different things in your stomach that you not, may not be allowed to, okay? And making the appropriate menus with your stage of your bariatric surgery. So if you're in week one, you wanna try to incorporate this, it's gonna be a little bit hard. So again, you can do the soups, you can do the, the liquids, and you can make, uh, you can get the broth out of the soups, but trying to be understanding of where you're at right now, it takes time, just like, adapting this diet, it takes time as well. And making grocery lists, I can definitely talk to you all about this a little more after the presentation, seeing where you can, uh, it's not hard, just making sure you see other, you see the foods that you're, you're getting and how to make that in a recipe, that's the key thing. And it takes, it's a week long process as well. My key thing is that don't cook on days that you shop and prep. It can be very hard to Add it to a new lifestyle. Because if you do this in all one one sitting in one day, it can be very hassle. Because you want to take this piece by piece. You want to cook on days that you're not shopping, so it provides you more time to be able to make that recipe as well. So just a just a really quick on this, if you guys can see this, is the to cook and eat at home more often. These are personal recommendations I can you can incorporate the diet. There's nothing really uh, significantly hard about it, but just cooking and eating at home more can play, play a big part. So eating vegetarian for one to two times a week. You can just, instead of focusing on the meat, you can always have beans, legumes, uh, you have rice along with the, uh, accommodating the, the beans. You can always make that, that big jump. Just stopping one meal can make a big, uh, play a big difference in trying to reach your goals for the Mediterranean diet. And trying a Mediterranean dish can be easy as getting hummus, getting uh, pita chips. You can also get uh, yogurt, Greek yogurt. Or you can even go home and you can make this basic lentil soup. Everything here that you see here is, is Mediterranean appropriate. So there's nothing, uh, there's no sodium other than the fact that the stock and the vegetables, if you wanted to try to straighten that out and put more uh, vegetables, that's definitely gonna be a big part. And I also put the nutrition facts as well too in the bottom in case you guys are wondering about that. 
The next thing is that the virgin olive oil, it is a key component for cooking, not having too much, not you know, putting the whole gallon and putting up to, uh, to this point in your, in your pan. Putting a little bit can go a long ways as well too. So steaming your, your uh, green leafy vegetables and also eating it raw can play a big part as well too. You wanna make sure that you, you eat the natural source of your vegetables as well. And you can always make salad. You can, you know, you can chop up your favorite vegetables, your favorite fruits, put it in a salad, put a little bit of Greek yogurt, and you can make it a pretty good source of your protein and your starches as well. So you wanna reduce the amount of dessert foods. So there's nothing wrong with these particular meals, but reducing the amount and starting from there can play a big part again as, a, as well too. So if your definition of a dessert is gonna be altered in this lifestyle, and that's gonna be fruits, mostly fruits as well too. So Greek yogurt, good source of protein. These are things that you know, if you are hungry, you can have that as a snack. And always try to switch it up rather than having potato chips, having Greek yogurt, or having celery, or peanut butter, or some other different type of snack option to help you with eating recommendations. And also, this might be a hard one, hard one for many, but meats as a side to your entree. So having it as a garnish. You can always make your salad, and you can have a little bit of your chicken or a little bit of fish on top as your garnish. So it's not the main emphasis in your dish. So having that switch can play a big part as well too. So instead of having packaged food, go for a handful of nuts. And I'm not saying you just get in the bowl and get this whole handful like this, but just getting a good amount of how much you can fit in your hand, in your palm, it's a good, a good uh, idea to, to utilize when getting from your container. And always, here's another thing I can provide for you. Always separate, don't go from the, the actual can and eating off of there. Always separate. So you have a hand, you scoop it up a little bit, put it in your hand, separate it from where it needs to go, put it separate from you, and enjoy that. And then once you're done with it, see where you're at, and then take your time and see if you wanna be able to eat a little bit more. But don't overindulge. Because that's the big thing is that we're programmed to, to pick and eat and, and, uh, and view the TV as well too. So what can you do now? The big thing is that what is one thing you can do to add in your lifestyle that can lead you closer to a mentoring diet? Can I get a participant? What do you think you can add from this, from this uh, presentation? What do you think you can add into your lifestyle to help you get closer to the mentoring diet? Plan ahead. Okay, that's a good one. You were saying? Add more vegetables. I don't really eat that many vegetables. There you go. That's a good place to start where you're at. So adding one cup, two cups, mm -hmm. can play a big difference as well. It's a good one. Adding more vegetables. Go I ahead. like the celery idea. Say it again? I like the celery idea. Yes. So you're getting your favorite. All the chicken just put it away. Yeah. <laughs> so you can have it on the side. You, there's, yeah. there's no problem with saying like no, no chicken, no meats, but just having it on the side. Yeah. Is the big thing. Not having it at the main focus, like having a 16 ounce steak, but having it a part of your salad, having three ounces, four ounces, that's a good idea to, idea to use as well, too. Anyone else? Adding the yogurt. Adding the yogurt. It's a simple fix. Nothing too drastic, just adding Greek yogurt as well, too, to help you out. Just to save you money as well, there's this bigger packages that you can always try to scoop and put into your yogurt, put into your bowl, and then saving money because you don't want to get the individualized ones all the time. You get the ones that are bigger, and you scoop it, and you put it back in the refrigerator, and put it where you need to put in your salad as well. So you can always put fruits and vegetables, honey with yogurt as well, and while saving money as well. Is yes. Kefir a form of, I think it's called kefir, a form of yogurt? Yeah. Or is it? It's a, it, it is. And it's a, when you, there's a special process to doing kefir. And I'm not really sure how to make it, because I know that like kombucha is a different way to get the mother spore and to produce its taste. So it's kefir is almost the same thing. There's a lot of good sorts of probiotics in there. I don't know how it's made, per se. I can't, 
can't confidently tell you, but I can let you know more, a little bit more information about that. Watch the sugar content again. Watch it. Oh, the sugar a lot of times they'll flavor it, and that bumps up the sugar content. You can definitely put vinegar as well too. Because I couldn't just use oil. No, I understand. <laughs> you can always put if different spices. Put vinegar, <laughs> yeah, everything I said here, you incorporate that into one meal. So spices, olive oil. You can do other fruits. Well, vinegar is good. You can do vinegar as well. If you're doing like the iceberg lettuce or the mixed greens, like yeah, vinegar, olive oil. That's a good combination as well. But what you can do better is that you can always add a little bit more of the vegetables. You can add a little bit of seeds along with that to make a more complete meal as well. Just to get more flavor and spices as well. Lemon is good with, um, I use avocado oil on my salad. And I just squeeze lemon, a little bit of garlic and it's awesome. You just made, you just made me hungry right there. <laughs> that's a good suggestion. <laughs> lemon is also a good suggestion too to add into your salads as well, to keep it that juicy flavor. I even do it on the vegetables, my steamed vegetables. Yeah? Good. Just the lemon, not the oil. So thank you so much for your guys' participation in as, uh, as well too. So I just provided all my references that I have up here. These are the ones that you will see here on the study. And there's some that have the picture and for the other studies as well too, to accompany my, my research. And also have another one from my books that I provided in this as well too. So when I was given this opportunity, I definitely wanted to play, you know, I wanted to be focused on this and provide you some good resource uh, articles. I don't want to do this from nearly from my experience. I want to provide you guys the optimal suggestions and research behind this, this uh, topic as well too. So do you guys have any questions? We have 10 minutes until the end. Go ahead, you're first. If, if you want to get out of the fog, there's a store called Casa Viva in Maricosa. Okay. And they do their own, they process their own olive oil okay. with um, spices and other things added to it, as well as vinegar. Mm. And they give you suggestions on mixing the two together and their, the dressings they come up with for the restaurant is only open a couple of days a week. Perfect. It's really good. Let's talk after. I'd love to get that the info as well, too. Have your hand up. Are you going to give us a recipe for the soup? Yeah, the soup is oh, right here. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's this back one right here. Okay. Yeah, so we have the lentil soup, and then we have another chicken recipe on the back side, too. Oh, okay. Anybody else? I'll take one. See Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So use this recipe as your baseline. You can always add more things into it. This is just suggestions. This is something that's appropriate for the main train lifestyle. Does anyone else have any other questions as well, too? Definitely love the questions. Go ahead. Where does cottage cheese fit into this? Cottage cheese fits into the dairy and also the protein source as well, too. So you can do dairy and for an alternative for protein as well. So you can always add uh, uh, cheese into your salads. It can also be a good part into your, uh, into your uh, entrees as well. So just trying to see what it can incorporate. Be creative. That's the main thing as well too for this as well too. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, how much soup does this make? This makes about four servings of a cup. Okay. So you'll see when when you I put the when when we put the liter of stock in there, mm -hmm. and you're boiling it, a lot of water escapes, and you'll see about a serving of a cup. So you can, if you're really hungry, you definitely have, there's two servings in there with you and someone else as well. Go ahead, good question. In the third event, there was wine. Where does that fit in? So <laughs> wine is not <laughs> suggested. <laughs> and I purposely did not put that on there because I want to be appropriate for you guys. It is a part of it, but you want to talk to your MD, you want to talk to a registered dietitian about that because that is a suggestion that you would want to talk to them. And I would not recommend it at any point to me because I want you guys to be safe about it. Do you guys have any other questions? I definitely love the questions as well too. We're gonna take just a little second while you're yeah, thinking of questions. 
Did everybody put in a raffle ticket? Anybody got to get a raffle ticket in? Did you get one or no? Okay. Anybody else that didn't get a raffle ticket? 